What industry secret do you know? Story one. I used to work in radio and we totally didn't take caller 10. We maybe counted from one to six and then sorted through the callers until we find an exciting sounding voice that fits the target demographic. I won a radio call in trivia at a local station. We had to answer questions about Frosty the Snowman and what all his features were made from. I guess the phone screeners had enough of everyone not getting the three questions right, so when I called and they picked up, I got two right but missed one about his eyes. The screener then just told me to say Cole and I think it was recorded and edited to make it seem like I got all three correct without prompting. I enjoyed $100 of gas back in the early 2000s. Can confirm, former DJ here, after a few, hits 96, your caller blank, try again, you go to, hits 96, who is this? If the person mumbled, Dave, it was always, oh, sorry, Dave, your caller number nine, so close. However, if they yelled, oh my god, am I caller number 10? And were all excited, you bet your damn ass they were caller number 10. Also, those send roses to catch him cheating type calls you hear, all fake. There are actually services that provide these. You get a script in the audio of the caller. DJ just hits play and follows the script and acts surprised or blown away. I've just got a job presenting at a really small town radio station. On the first day of training, I was told that nine times out of 10, when they do phone-ins or quizzes, etc., and announce winners, nobody actually called in. They just make up names. Luckily, the station is so small town it doesn't give out prizes or do live phone-ins or anything. It's just for fun. But yeah, I was thrown when they told me that. Felt like Dorothy seeing behind the curtain of Oz. I worked in a radio station for years that is pretty big in a city. We actually took real prizes for real callers. The prizes are cheap and given to us for free by promoters, and that gives us goodwill and free advertising for the person who wins when they tell everyone good stuff about us. No cost to us. However, all the music is just made of big blocks recorded by DJs in Florida with spaces for commercial breaks to be inserted. When someone calls and requests a popular song, we were trained to just say it would be up soon. Chances were, it would be anyway. Story 2 I am working at a sports club with over 2,000 members and I can tell you that you might sign some papers about data security and how we handle data, but believe me, your data will go places you don't want it to go. My cousin worked in HR for a 250 employee company. She had all of the information from everyone on her personal laptop because they never gave her a work laptop. Salaries, social security numbers, addresses, everything. Literally true everywhere. I have a Yahoo email specifically for places that require one, but in which I won't read them. I cleaned that Yahoo account to zero on November 1st. As of today, there are 23,614 unread emails in there. Everyone sells your info. Everyone. I don't understand how this seems to happen to people. I use a regular email address for 90% of things I need to create an account for, and I get maybe one or two emails a month unless I've bought some, in which case there are a few shipments, and that's including spam. What are people doing to get 23,000 emails in a few months? Are y'all just throwing your emails around everywhere like a $5 hooker on sale? Not ever bothering to tick the please don't bother me with your BS box when signing up for things? I legit don't get it either. Lists are continuously sold over and over, so I guess. But I look at some of the emails and it's from stuff I've never even heard of. Tons of home lending, student loan lending, refinancing, health insurance, and life insurance, in addition to numerous pushes to buy crap. And I've noticed that so many of these places send anywhere from three to six emails a day. I've given this email to, I'm guessing, three places that I want slash need their email. I'm to the point of opening a new one and moving these three to the new one and just abandoning this email. I've literally done that several times. I have several emails out there that have been hanging on for 10 or more years. I don't even know the password on some. The only reason I haven't done this yet is sheer laziness. Story 3 I'm no longer shocked by the vast amount of software that we all use on a daily basis that is rushed into production, shoddy, insecure, held together with spit and band-aids, etc, etc. I'm amazed everything hasn't just collapsed into dust already. Every. Day. We just canceled a big Oracle project because after five years they hadn't fixed a single one of our long list of showstopper errors. People just learning to code, getting their CS degree, have no idea that some of the biggest software companies in the world are shipping code I wouldn't let my Girl Scout troop get away with. Then your boss will sign a contract without talking to you and say, but they're one of the biggest names in the industry. They're the best in the breed. What do you mean it doesn't work at all? As someone who worked in QA for a number of years in the 2000s, I noticed a complete 
complete disregard for testing processes and companies are literally eliminating testing positions over the last 10 years because they don't see a correlation to revenue. I'm not sure it's going to get better with automation or AI. I work on government infrastructure now, and we have five environments below production, just so that we can hammer out every possible bug before implementing into production. This is not standard practice in private sector. When I jumped from the public to the private sector, I was stunned. The average public sector developer is far above the average private sector developer. The private sector rock stars, though, far exceed the public sector. That's been my experience, at least. It's all about money. In the private sector, time is money. So as long as you meet the deadlines, you are good to go. In the public sector, it actually matters what you are pushing out. So you need to be good at what you're doing. But if you are really good at your job, then the private sector will pay more and give you more freedom. Story 4. I'm in insurance. If you call to request an estimate for a claim, they will count it as a $0 claim on your file when they deem the damage not enough to repair. That means when another company pulls your information, it will not only impact your future rates but might make you ineligible for future policies. Don't ever call insurance for an estimate first. Get a third-party inspector to tell you whether you should file with insurance. Yo, this happened to me. I had a crack in my windshield and called to see if it was covered. They said yeah, but it was $500 for a deductible. So I declined and went to repair it at a local shop. A couple of years later, I was dealing with another insurance company about something else and they said that I had made a claim on a windshield repair a few years ago. I was like, WTF? Insurance broker here, great advice. They are sneaky like that. In Canada, we have collision centers. If you hit someone in a parking lot but can't find the person, you are supposed to jot down their information, plate number, and go to the collision center. The center is required by law to report it to your insurance company and contact the other person, even if it's just a small scratch on a 2003 Honda Civic and the other person doesn't want to file a claim, and neither do you, costing the company zero dollars. They will use it as an at fault. Total BS. I learned this the hard way. I hit someone in a courthouse parking lot which has cameras everywhere. I didn't make a single scratch on their old beater but I felt like I had to do the right thing. So I went in and followed the instructions from the front desk officer, FML. My insurance company called me a week later and said it was at fault. I said, did the third party make a claim? No. Did I make a claim? There was no freaking damage at all. I was just doing the right thing. Well, no sir, but we need to use it as an at fault anyway. What? However, we do have minor at fault collision in Ontario now. Not sure about other provinces, which means any claim with a payout under $2,000 can be labeled minor and can't affect your rates as much. That helps. Still takes away your one-time accident forgiveness if you have it though. I also worked in insurance and can explain why this is the case. I worked for one of the large US insurance companies about five years ago. At that time, and for that company, a claim cost them $675 to process before a single dollar was paid out. That is the call center itself, the person who answered the phone, the desk adjuster, the claim is sent to, the field adjuster it's assigned to, the gas to get the adjuster to the home, the car, the adjuster drives, health and benefits for all these people, and on and on and on. Even if the claim pays zero dollars, all of these aspects must be paid for. Just the act of calling and filing a claim costs the company money. Another industry secret, the reason deductibles actually exist is to reduce the number of filed claims. It's not about saving that $1,000 from every paid claim, it's entirely about reducing the people who will call and file a claim in the first place. I used to work at one of the biggest car insurance companies, and while I believe your last paragraph, I also know that the specific company I worked for had it in their contract that you were required to report any damage to your car, whether you intended to file a claim or not. I wouldn't be surprised if similar language is in the contracts for most of the big companies. It's like two opposing ideas at work, require the damage to be reported so that you can gather as many possible data points about risk within certain demographics, and also having the deductible to make it less likely to actually have to start the claims process and inevitably pay out. All that being said, if you believe a single word from insurance industry audits and reporting, car insurance companies almost always end up with single-digit margins, and a lot of them make more money from investing their profits rather than the yearly profit itself. I specifically remember hearing that State Farm, not the company I worked for, broke even a surprising number of years, if you only counted auto premiums in versus the operating costs of that division. I was driving down the interstate one day when suddenly there was a bale of hay laying on the road right in front of me. It looked as if it had had been hit already as the bale wasn't fully intact. I had a semi to my right and a few other cars in the lane to my left. I had no option to sense to avoid it, so I slowed as quickly as I could and inevitably hit it. 
Afterwards, I could hear stuff dragging below my car, so I took the nearest exit and parked to examine the damage. It definitely did some damage to my skid plate, but I was unable to tell if there was any more serious damage. I called the police to get a report done just in case I decided to file an insurance claim. The cop showed up, mentioned he had gotten several calls about the hay bales, and quickly wrote up a report for me. In the end, there wasn't any major damage done, so I never filed a claim with insurance. However, about a year later, I was searching around for a new auto insurance provider, and after they ran my info, they denied me coverage because of this hay bale instance. I explained the situation to them and how I decided to never file a claim, but they didn't care. I never once reached out to my insurance about a potential claim, but the police report was enough for them to decide I wasn't insurable. Looking back on it now, I should have never made that police report. The young me was under the impression that having a police report explaining exactly what happened would help the insurance process go smoother. Little did I know it would bite me in the butt in the long run. Story 5 this one is fairly well known, but I'm just confirming its truth as someone who used to work in a factory. The brand you buy doesn't always matter. Sometimes it's all the same stuff that comes out of the same vats, but just labeled differently and sold at different price ranges. I work in a bottling plant. It's an independent Pepsi bottler. We make Aquafina and also our own labeled water. It's 100% the same thing. Same bottle, same water, same standards, same caps. The only difference is the label. We don't even stop running when we switch from Aquafina to our water. They just stop the labeler, change the label, and keep going. Never buy name brand water. The Wonder Bread loaf that looks like the Kirkland loaf and looks like the store brand loaf are all the same loaf. We just change the bags. The same goes for hot dog buns and hamburger buns. There are only two industrial bakery companies in the USA, Bimbo and Flowers. Bimbo is based out of Mexico, Flowers out of the USA. All store brands are made by one of those two companies. Dave's Killer Bread equals Flowers, Ballpark equals Bimbo, Wonder Bread equals Flowers, Oro Wheat, Bimbo. Even for the same brand, which is often done to get around rain check laws for electronics and appliances. In California, we have laws against bait and switch schemes, so it doesn't matter even if they say, while well, supplies last. Whenever someone says, oh sorry, we sold out, I then demand a rain check. These days, I usually have to demand that the clerks get the manager when they try to tell me, oh, we don't do that. Happened last summer at Barnes & Noble, and what do you know, the sold out 50% off item showed up at my house a week later. But the loophole comes down to the serial number, and you will see this BS usually around the holidays when they have those doorbuster specials like 50-inch TV for a hundred bucks. So they don't have everyone using rain checks, they will have the manufacturer produce some of them with a different, unique serial or model number. Exactly the same device, just a different number. So you can keep coming back for months, that model number will never reappear on the shelves. Just to expand it a little bit, sometimes the different brands are interchangeable. Sometimes there's a real difference. For example, my hometown has a giant cheese factory that makes processed cheeses for a crap ton of brands. Some of the labels they run really are are the very same thing as expensive slash non-expensive brands, but sometimes they're not. Even when they ideally spec out the same ingredients, sometimes the cheaper brand has looser requirements for how long they can go between the machines, how big of a variance is allowed in ingredients and finished products, etc. That can make a meaningful difference on the end product, especially if you're buying something made towards the end of that production run before they had to stop to clean. It's not always the case that the same factory means the same products mean the same quality for different brands, but sometimes it does. Sometimes the only genuine difference is the label on the package. Don't assume the cheaper brand is worse quality, but also don't assume it's not worse quality. For consumables and relatively inexpensive things like foods, toilet paper, etc., it's worth testing out the cheap brands to see if you like them, just the same as the name brand though, because you might save yourself a bundle of money for something that's really the same or similar quality. The only way you know is to try. Story 6. Beer taps at bars and restaurants are not always clean and can be very dirty. Highly dependent on the location. Every place I brewed at personally, we had a good schedule of cleaning the tap lines. My word of wisdom is to look into the brew house area if you can. If it's dirty, dirty fermenter feet, dirty tank walls, stuff strewn about, etc., then they're probably also not keeping up with cleaning their lines. Let's not even talk about the glassware behind the bar or the fruit garnish. Glasses are washed in a sink with scrubbers that haven't been cleaned in years, used to wash the glasses. The entire wash process takes about five seconds. Then the glasses are put on a filthy bar mat to dry. Almost every wine glass has lipstick on it if you hold it up to the light. The garnish tray probably hasn't been cleaned in a decade. The waitstaff comes by and uses the garnish tray as a snack bar after emptying the trash and dirty plates without ever washing their hands. 
source, bartender and bar manager for a decade. The guy who owned a small pizza place near me cleaned taps and keg lines as a side gig. He used to tell us when he found a place that surprised him and how much they cared or didn't, he told them that he needed to do it more frequently. Unfortunately, knocked a couple of favorite spots out of your rotation, but I appreciate not drinking from moldy lines. Ironically, the beer at his pizzeria slash restaurant always seemed flat. Don't know if it was a temperature, the place is pretty old, and I'm sure coolers aren't working particularly efficiently, or what, but I ended up buying bottled beer most of the time. Story 7. As a cybersecurity consultant, I can tell you many, many companies I have worked with are a when they are hacked, not if they are hacked. Some organizations have people in charge of cybersecurity who barely know how basic protocols and technologies work. Also, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked to provide analysis, and after I present my findings, half of my recommendations are met with, yeah, our end users might complain, we're not going to do that. I've worked in medical admin most of my career, bridging the gaps between administrators and their corporate overlords frontline workers and doctors slash shareholders. I've been trying to get into consulting because I've entirely too many gaps in their system and from a revenue cycle, regulatory compliance, and operations standpoint, I have a lot of knowledge on how to streamline things. However, I lack in-depth knowledge of the cybersecurity aspect, which I would really like to understand better so I can try to help at the root, like the change healthcare ransomware attack debacle. I feel like this is my calling and opportunity to finally be heard to do something about it at the facility level. I just don't have a source on the nitty-gritty technicalities and how to get my foot in that door. Is there any way you or someone you know would be willing to educate slash mentor me on the subject? As someone who used to be a consultant, I said the same thing. Then I moved into the engineering side of cybersecurity into a company, and after looking around other companies, I was just surprised at how any company can somehow function sometimes. People look at cybersecurity as something in the background, with a little budget until crap hits the fan. Literally, and in some cases, no matter the budget, internal mess between different parts of IT makes you wonder how some companies are able to function and you realize most companies are like the Titanic in the senses that they can strengthen, upgrade many elements, but somehow, somewhere, a 15-year-old script in EBS running an EOL server and created by someone who long left the company will break one day and sink the ship. I audit firms on a regular basis for their SOC, 2, HIPAA, PCI DSS, etc. And the amount of things I find is absolutely insane and they wonder why we issue them qualified reports. Not a good thing in our industry, people lose jobs over this, and they still do the same crap the next audit period. I have found that unless a third party is requiring them to pass an audit, most companies will just let things slide. Deprecated software, insecure software development practices, too much damn access of everyone in Active Directory, passwords on sticky notes under keyboards, ugh. The list goes on and on, but I can tell you one thing. Our data is never protected half as good as what these companies tell us. I have audited Fortune 50 companies and definitely some big tech firms we all use on the daily. All bad. Story 8. Enterprise Rent-A-Car buys their cars straight from the manufacturers at a lower price than the dealerships get. After they rent them for a year, they sell them to the public at a price higher than they originally paid. One of the shops I worked at did service on Enterprise cars. Doesn't matter what the manufacturer recommends, they all get the cheapest 5W30 regular oil in every car they send us. Wouldn't pay for the synthetic requirements or even request the correct viscosity. I'm not even mad about that, it just seems like good economics. Enterprise is going to buy more cars than any dealer every year and has a more stable demand, so they'd be a more attractive customer to the car manufacturers and can negotiate better prices. I just spent two months cycling through various enterprise vehicles while our vehicle was getting repaired, crash damage, other party at fault. We have an AWD Volvo and they were supposed to give us an equivalent car but nothing they had available was either the right size or all-wheel drive. They all had nearly 50k miles on. They were all damaged in some way or another and they were all stripped down models. We were taking a road trip to Arizona over the winter so I finally went in and demanded a real SUV. UV. What they came up with was a 2019 Suburban with 60k miles on it, and they wanted it back as soon as possible because they were sending it to auction. I was a driver for a rental firm for a year whilst at uni. They carefully tracked the mileage of each vehicle because each make and model has a different maximum price point depending on how many miles it's done. So some can be sold at 15 to 20k miles whilst others will with only a few thousand on them to maximize return. Some of those cars had barely been in the yard for a month before being sold off. Story 9. 
There are tons of buildings out there that don't meet the code, even new construction. Inspectors either don't care, don't know the code, or don't even bother to inspect in the first place. On the plus side, building code is extremely over-conservative. So if you get close, it's probably safe, maybe most of the time, except when it's not, and then everyone gets sued. Three to four of my friends who purchased houses or condos in the last five years have had to do extensive, like 25 to 30% of the value of the property repairs because of bad construction work. Inspectors didn't notice anything. Not saying this is what your friends experienced at all, but just to make a point, a lot of people do not understand what built to code does not equal built with quality. The code is for safety. You can have a perfectly safe house built to code that is absolute crap quality. Another thing people think is that building inspectors are inspecting workmen. This is often not the case. They only care that the code is met and the drawings were generally followed. They couldn't care less if your flooring was improperly laid or your walls have the correct paint on them. I started working in HVAC warranty just as the pandemic hit. The amount of warranty work blew my mind. I saw everything on a warranty list. Wrong screws for cabinets, stairs not fully secured. Hell, even our team would install wall units without the drain tube connected. New construction is filled with new workers who don't know anything. It's a race to the bottom to maximize profits. It's why they can afford to pay for warranty work. There's literally tons of dollars left to play with. Also, you're not getting top quality products. The indoor units and outdoor units were below the bottom tier. Most would need to be replaced within the next two to three years. If you can, buy an older home or one built 20 years ago. Anything sooner than that is lucky if it's still standing. Story 10. In a lot of cases, the fancier the marketing, the messier the management. At one of my jobs, they were looking for a project management platform to help with project schedules. Upper management wanted to know why turnaround times were slow. I suggested a Basecamp alternative that connected more seamlessly to all of our apps and would set up an on-site server that could be securely managed. We suffered from too many middle managers, and I knew that they were where all of the delays came from. So when I pitched this software, I left out the activity tracker. After the first quarter of use, I printed out the tracker timeline and it showed big blue bars that were weeks long and represented the middle management review turnaround time. Their answer to this problem wasn't streamlining the review process. Instead, they decided to hire more middle management, which ended up making it worse. Their answer to that was moving to Basecamp, which didn't report the same way. As a manager, marketing is the bane of my existence. You have your operations running tight. Everyone is hitting their targets, but then marketing tries to justify their paychecks and reinvent the wheel on a line of perfectly fine products. New requirements, new prices, new contents, and everyone is confused. Customers included. I always deploy their new stuff verbatim on a pilot site and see how it goes. Horribly 90% of the time. And then we try to find a way to adapt it or go around it and make it actually work. By the time we succeed, their BS doesn't even remotely resemble what they gave us. It has been ground and digested by our processes. It is barely more than a new coat of paint. Story 11. Work in large-scale construction. Large developers effectively borrow on the credit of all the smaller players who are their subcontractors. You have billion-dollar companies asking smaller companies to pay for them with a promise to pay later. The larger the developer, the slower the process is to get paid. If a project goes bust, it's these small guys that get hit because all of the developers have LLEs that are project-specific, no assets to speak of. Just to add, the big developers leverage the income from the first tranche of home sales and use as collateral for security on the loan for the next project. Because those funds are used as collateral, they must be set aside in trust and can't be used to pay contractors or to address problems in the current project. This means the big developer won't have the cash to pay the contractors or address problems until the first project nears its completion and most of the homes are sold. Yep, any project of large size that has its own development company is something to watch out for if you don't know who you're really working for. I worked on a hospital project that took almost three years to get paid. Their payment terms were net 120, which they violated all the time. That project ended up going through three owners between 2015 and 2017. We stopped showing up in late 2016 and didn't get our last invoice paid until mid-2019. This is 100% true. I worked in the facilities and construction department for a major hospital in a major city. The subs were desperate to get contracts with us, so they would agree to foot the bill for materials with a promise of reimbursement later. However, it was our unwritten policy to squeeze them for discounts later on, which the subs were basically forced to agree to because 
there were plenty of others lined up who were hungry for jobs. Even then, it took forever and multiple carefully worded requests from the subs before we finally paid them. We never ever paid according to the contract terms. It was absolutely disgusting and I felt really bad for these small business subs who were just trying to do good work and make an honest dollar. Story 12. When you send your food back to the kitchen, we fix slash remake it and then make it right and typically feel bad if it's our mistake. If it's the server's mistake who put it in the ticket, it's okay if she makes up for it with a round of iced water, sodas, or later on beer. If the customer didn't understand that a BLT had bacon on it, we would still fix it but call you an idiot. Side note, servers talking to the kitchen will be the customer. They said then they knew it had bacon in it. Servers talking to the customers blame the kitchen. Ugh, I told the chef no bacon. I apologize. We don't care. You work for tips. We get paid either way. Here's your BLT. My god, this reminds me of this one time this family came with a 7-8 to eight year old and he wanted some spicy wings. Now, I can handle spicy stuff just fine. I can eat about six atomic flavored wings from Wingstop. That's my spiciness tolerance, and the spicy wings we have at my job are indeed spicy, but I can eat them just fine. The manager let the couple know that the wings would probably be too spicy for the kid, but the parents and the kid were like, nah, he loves spicy. The manager takes the wings to the kid, bites into it, and sends them back because it is too spicy. I worked as a cook for four years, and this is so right. I can't tell you how many times I've had a server flash a wad of cash and tell me I'm working on the wrong side of the house. It's like, that's sweet. I'm glad you had a good night. Yesterday, you only made 60 bucks on your four-hour shift. The consistency of 40 hours a week plus overtime when someone called out was more than enough for me. Later on in my cooking career, when I had more responsibility, I got 5% of the net on days we went positive. It was always a nice bonus, but I didn't have to depend on a good night to pay the bills. Story 13. We'll write in the UK here. If you have 325,000 pounds in assets or less, and you don't intend to exclude anyone from your will, you need a bog standard will. If you don't need a solicitor to write it, and if it costs you more than 150 pounds plus VAT, then it's a ripoff. It takes me about an hour's worth of work to gather information and write that will. I would recommend getting a power of attorney though. It's a pain in the ass if you lose capacity without it. In the US, most people live in a state that recognizes holographic slash holographic testaments, meaning a piece of paper you write out, date, and sign entirely handwriting is recognized as valid without having to have it notarized or even witnessed. If you don't have a will, go make one today, like right now, even if you don't have enough money to worry about inheritance. It will take literally one minute and it makes life so much easier for the people handling your estate. Story 14. I worked at a Marriott for several years. I learned the following. Bed bugs happen more often than you would think. There's not much we can do about it. A hotel with frequent international travelers is bound to end up with someone who brought something with them in their luggage every now and then. Every now and again? I forget which is the proper saying. All we can do is quarantine and clean the room when the problem is discovered. Those sheets are probably not as clean as you think. People in the hallway can hear you having fun in your room. Or you watch adult videos if you don't wear headphones. Always flip the bolt lock on your door. People make mistakes in booking slash blocking rooms. I can't count how many times a room has been double booked, which leads to very awkward slash interaction. If you had something bad happen to you or are angry at something you booked not working out, make a bit of a fuss. You can usually get free food slash drinks or a free night stay. Don't be a dick about it. Accidents happen and it's often not the fault of the person you will be interacting with. But hotels bend over backward in order to not get a bad review. At the hotel I worked at, every review lower than a 9 or 10 was considered a zero. So get your money's worth. Lastly, we can smell the smoke slash weed coming from your room. We can also smell you leave. We might not be able to do anything about it when it happens, but you will absolutely be charged for the one to two extra nights that the room is unavailable while we clean the stench out. Please stop smoking in the rooms. You're the only one who can't smell it. Everyone else can. We know you're lying. Stop being childish. To add, on sold out nights, general managers push to overbook the hotel. This is because there are usually a few no-shows and selling the hotel 100%, even if they have to pay for someone's room elsewhere, gives them more bonuses at the end of the year. But coming slightly under does nothing. Poor front desk staff get screwed because they're the ones getting yelled at, trying to find a hotel to send people, and they get none of the benefits. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you would like to share with us, please leave it in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.